It doesn't happen often, but occasionally you have professionals in the medical field who become extremely controversial from saying and claiming some、uh, not so smart things. Here's Andrew Wakefield, who has openly claimed that vaccinations cause autism. Since then, other scientists have rejected him and his claims. Anyway, he recently did a video on the channel Larry Cook, which I've actually done multiple responses to already. This seems to be one of the bigger channels that dedicate itself to fighting vaccinations. I believe that vaccines cause autism. But clearly, a lot of children get vaccinated, and only some develop autism. Why some and not others? And this comes down, I believe, in large part to the pattern of exposure. What do I mean by that? I mean age of exposure. Another pattern of exposure, which is extremely important, is the route of exposure. All right. So two factors that make some children autistic, but not others: the age in which the vaccination was received and the method of delivery. Got it. Let's see you justify these claims. Take a, a disease like measles, or indeed mumps, or rubella, or chickenpox. These were respiratory pathogens that we would inhale. They would go through our nasal and oral passages, through the lungs, and the natural way in which the immune system had been set up to deal with these infections was there, resident in the lining of the、uh, the respiratory tract, and was a system of immune cells that took up the virus. That processed the virus in a particular way, presented it to the immune system in a particular way, that then invoked the beginnings of a protective response, clearance of the virus, and recovery from the infection. Alrighty, so far there isn't much to say here, since he's just presenting some basic facts about our body's immune defense. A bit of an oversimplification, but that's fine. However, arguments do tend to be more convincing if they are simplified to be more easily understood by the general public. Anyway, what I would say here is that yes, we do have an adaptive immune response that can target specific antigens presented, and yes, this is a very powerful method of defense, which vaccinations utilize, by the way. But the adaptive immune response can take several days to reach its peak potential, and by then the virus or bacteria. Would have already been overpowering your innate immune system and causing damage to the body. Now, what happened with vaccination is we completely changed all that. So, in a heartbeat, we changed the pattern of exposure, the route of exposure, from something that nature had set up over a very long period to injecting it subcutaneously. I love how you just added the word subcutaneously in there. So yeah, I guess vaccinations is an introduction of antigens in a different way. So what? I don't see anything wrong with the method of exposure. And what if we just had people inhale vaccinations? That would be fine for you. The immune system had never seen it in that way, and in many cases, it's not surprising that it just put up its hands and said, "I don't get this." What? Excuse me. Pretty sure the immune system doesn't care. No matter how the pathogens got into the body, it's going to perform its regular response. I mean, let's just think about your claim for just a second. Many infections can come from a sharp object penetrating the skin. Tetanus, for example. Does the immune system, according to your logic, just give up when that happens? <laughs> to develop a, a healthy immune response to any environmental pathogen, to an infectious agent, what we need is a balanced immune response. I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt here, since you did used to hold a high position in the medical field. Perhaps this is just so advanced that I haven't even heard of it, and he's just simplifying it to the point at which it sounds dumb but isn't. <laughs> yeah, let's just imagine that possibility for a second. Broadly, two elements to it: the antibody-producing side of the immune system, what's called a T helper cell type two response, and the ability of the cellular immune system to identify. Virally infected cells, and to seek them out and destroy them, and that is predominantly a T helper cell type one response. What we need to be healthy is a balance between Th two and Th one. Okay, so I actually just recorded a huge segment that briefly went over the Th one and Th two responses, and then I doubted myself, so I went online to double check. And guess what? He's not entirely wrong. According to one paper I found, the Th one and Th two responses can serve to inhibit one another. Obviously, the overactivation of either of these responses can cause autoimmunity, since they negatively influence one another. A balance between Th one and Th two is required to avoid disease. I honestly wouldn't have thought of this, since Th one is responsible for intracellular threats such as viruses, cancer, and intracellular bacteria. And Th2 deals with extracellular pathogens, but big but here, there's a lot more than just suppression. The Th1 and Th2 pathways have multiple crossovers that allow them to affect each other in many complicated ways, other than just negatively feeding each other. But yeah, let's just go with what you said as being true. Now, when we change the dose or the age or the route of exposure, 
then potentially, and in the real world, we alter that balance. How exactly is this balance altered? I'm uneasy about this guy now because, you know, he's definitely spewing bullshit about vaccinations, but he could also be correct on some things. I wouldn't expect anything less from a former medical professional. And when you give certain infectious agents or their products subcutaneously, you produce a bias. Okay, well, is it just subcutaneously? Pretty sure a lot of vaccinations are given intramuscularly. Towards this pro-allergic antibody response. Now, we measure antibodies as a measure of immunity, but they're not a good measure of immunity because they tell us nothing about the T helper cell type 1 response and the ability to kill intracellular infections like viruses. Okay, okay, you guys are probably confused here, so I'm just going to summarize his arguments briefly. This is an argument presented by some anti-vaxxers that is actually not very popular. You don't hear this argument often, but it does exist. Basically, they claim that vaccinations stimulate primarily the Th2 response from T helper cells. This generates antibodies and leaves behind memory cells. However, they claim that this neglects the Th1 response, which in turn becomes relatively weaker, thus preventing the body from fighting off intracellular diseases. They then claim that this disrupts the Th1 and Th2 balance, which then makes the body more susceptible to pathogens. Indeed, the greater the antibody response, the greater the T helper cell type 1 or 2 response, then reciprocally then the, the lower the Th1 response. So we're actually, this is not, more is not necessarily good. Here's the problem with the argument though. The Th1 and Th2 responses aren't exclusive. They overlap. One of the main effects, perhaps, is the suppression, but recent research does show that the two pathways are able to reinforce each other and even perform some of the duties in the other pathway. This has been seen by observing the Th1 and Th2 cells on a biochemical level. Many Th1 cells are able to stimulate antibody production, something that is a primary trait of the Th2 pathway. Th2 cells, meanwhile, can regulate expression of Th1 cell response. Of course, there's more to it than that, but I'm just simplifying here. In short, these two pathways work together in a harmonious manner, making the immune system release more antibodies, a trait of the Th2 pathway doesn't only lead to strict inhibition of Th1 cells. Because of this, cells of Th1 or Th2 aren't actually the determining factors in the pathway due to their overlapping nature. No, it's actually the cytokines, or the immune system proteins that serve as the banner to each of these responses. Furthermore, Th1 and Th2 aren't the only two types of T helper cell pathways. There is Th17 and Th alpha beta, which also play many interconnected roles with Th1 and Th2. Now that that's out of the way, I must say that any suppression effects to Th1 that does come about from Th2 stimulation are temporary. In a healthy individual, which we would assume the receiver of the vaccine is, since, you know, he's getting a vaccination, suppression effects only last a short while before they are recovered to normal levels. So yeah, nice attempt at trying to present some advanced level immunology to attack vaccinations. It's telling us that there is an imbalance in the system. So merely looking at antibodies and saying this is protection against the disease is a very, very simplistic. Uh, and potentially hazardous way of, of, of viewing this system. Antibody count is a fine way of determining someone's susceptibility to a disease. I mean, if you think about it, it's logical. Viruses integrate its DNA into the host by infecting it, and how can it infect it if there is already an active adaptive response to it by B and T cells? So when you change the pattern of exposure, when you change the root, the dose, the age, or indeed give concurrent infections at the same time in polyvalent vaccines, then you have the ability, the potential to profoundly alter this balance in the way the immune system is set up. That's an outrageous claim. Have you forgotten that the body is constantly under attack by pathogens? Every day our body has to deal with all sorts of infections. This is much more extreme than any vaccinations we give. How is it worse to inject a small amount of antigens to trigger an adaptive immune response? The outcome is so much better than the cost, since it prepares the body for future infections. The other thing to take into consideration when, when thinking about this issue of immune balance and imbalance is what else is in the vaccines. Not the live viral vaccines, but for example, in the DPT and in the uh, Hib vaccine, DTA. Yeah, all right. This is just some basic anti-vaxxer arguments now against other ingredients in the vaccinations. But this video isn't about that, so I'm going to end it right here. Wow, this video was pretty difficult to make. It's during times like these when I wish I knew more about biology. But yeah, it's impossible for me to know everything. I hope you still enjoy the video, though. God damn.